Welcome back everybody to another reaction video while well, keeping with my theme of the history of the moment right now. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to see my reaction from yesterday to all of the events that were unfolding in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, with the events surrounding the Queen, um, Queen Elizabeth II and her uh, procession toward her funeral, which will be uh, in London next week. Um, I'll put a link in the description. I'll throw it up at the end as well. You can check that out. Some of the highlights from what happened yesterday. I will be doing more of those. And the plan is to do a live stream during the funeral and kind of just talk through it and maybe watch it with you guys. So uh, more details to follow about that. But today we're going to go to watchmojo.com. They have a video called the 10 greatest moments from the Queen's reign. So I thought it'd be pretty cool to check that out and maybe just talk a little bit about the moments. I haven't seen this video yet, so I don't know what moments they're going to share, but we'll offer some insight along the way. Hope you enjoy it. As always, the original content, there's a link in the description. You can check that out without my commentary if you wish. Let's dive in. Inevitably, a long life can pass by many milestones. My own is no exception. Welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we're counting down our picks for the 10 greatest moments from the reign of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. That was a good we one there. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. COVID speech. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. For this list, we're looking at the Queen's greatest mm, achievements I know during which her one lifetime that is. and the grand legacy she has left behind, following her passing in 2022 at the age of 96. Let us know in the comments your favorite memory of Her Majesty the Queen. Number 10, The Queen's Speech. Since 1932, the monarch of the UK has delivered a Christmas speech. 25 years ago, my grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages. Today is another landmark. The tradition was begun by TV. King George V and was initially broadcast over the radio, but in 1957, five years into her reign, the Queen made the decision to broadcast the speech on television. I very much hope that this new medium will make my Christmas message more personal and direct. From then on, the televised Queen's speech became a mainstay of Christmas Day. It's a way for the sovereign to reflect on the year and restate their role as the country's head of state. So if, you know, a lot of people talk about the monarchy, and listen, I, I get it. I'm a very pro-monarchy person, okay? So I understand that I'm coming from that bias in all of this. And I know not all of you see it that way, and it's okay. Um, but a lot of people accuse the monarchy of being stuffy and old-fashioned and traditional, which they are all of those things. That's true. But give the queen some credit here. Uh, this is a woman of the greatest generation. This is a World War II veteran here that we're talking about who was, was able to keep the monarchy relevant across her 70 years on the throne. Uh, and one of the ways that they did that was by adapting. Her grandfather, George V, did it by adapting to radio. Uh, her father, of course, very famously had a, a difficult time communicating, but understood that was part of his role. And he worked hard to make himself able to do that. She took it the next step. To t TV. Another thing that she did, and I'm, they may talk about this, is that they filmed and they put on TV her coronation in 1953. I've read somewhere that it was the very first live television event in history. I don't know if that's 100% true or not, but I've read that it is. So uh, these are things that show that she understood that the way that a monarch communicates and communicating and connecting to the people is one of their primary roles now. Um, that it had to evolve. Christmas can be hard for those who have lost loved ones. This year especially, I understand why. Mm. Televising it was part of the Queen's modernization of her the last monarchy, one. making it more accessible and making herself a reliable figure people felt they knew during her life. Number nine, surviving assassination. People forget this. As an extremely prominent public figure, there were numerous unsuccessful attempts on the Queen's life over the years, including two in 1981 alone. 
Now, I believe those were blanks that were being fired, but nobody knew that at the time. And she handled it admirably. She kept going. She was on the a horse. The first happened during Trooping the Color that year, when a man named Marcus Sargent fired six blanks at Her Majesty, later claiming he wanted to be famous. He was sent to prison for treason for five years and apparently regretted the incident. That October, New Zealander Christopher John Lewis also tried to assassinate her during a royal tour to the country, firing a shot that missed. Charles has also had a few attempts made on his life, while Queen Victoria famously had eight assassins try their luck. Number 8. The Crown Act Officially the succession to the Crown Act 2013, this landmark piece of legislation reformed the process of succession to the British throne. Big Previously, one. male heirs always got priority in the line of succession, and Her Majesty only became the Queen because her father, George VI, didn't have any sons, only her and right. her sister, the Princess Margaret. So I talked about this in a previous video a couple of days ago. Uh, the UK has gone from... Um, male preference primogeniture to absolute primogeniture. Male preference means if there is a male child of the monarch, it goes to them. Uh, so that's why, for example, she was never made Princess of Wales as what would be called the heir apparent. She was the heir presumptive because there was always the possibility that her father, King George VI, however unlikely, could have a son. And so let's say that her mother had died. He remarries. Even late in life, he has a, a new wife. She has a son. That son would immediately have gone ahead of her in the line of succession. And she never would have become queen. Uh, that changes starting with George, who right now is the son of the Prince of Wales. Um, George, let's say something happens to him his sister would inherit the throne over their younger brother, Louis. If George has a daughter before he has a son and George becomes king, that daughter would be the heir rather than the son if the son is younger. Now the eldest child always takes precedent regardless of gender if they were born after 2011. It also got rid of the necessity for senior royals to get the sovereign's permission to marry. It was just one of many modernizations of the monarchy that the Queen oversaw, abandoning many of its more outdated traditions. And you might say, well, ah, she didn't really have a choice, but she does. I mean, she gives royal assent. A lot of the stuff that the monarch does seems ceremonial, but the monarch in theory, well, not in theory, in fact, has very real power. A lot of that power gets delegated to the prime minister or to other members of the government, but the monarch still has that power. The monarch's the commander in chief of the military. If they wanted to, they could give orders to the military. Now, some of those things, if they exercise that power, might cause a backlash that could lead to the elimination of the monarchy in theory. Um, she has to give royal, or he, now the king, has to give royal assent to any laws that are passed. The king has to sign off on those. He's got veto power. King can dissolve parliament if he wants to. Now, like I said, does he exercise any of these authorities? No, but he does have that power. Number seven, the this London Olympics and Diamond Jubilee. 2012 was a massive year for the UK. Not only were we chosen to host the Summer Olympic Games that year in London, but it was also the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, a celebration of 60 years on the throne. Both events were monumental, and Britain came third on the medal table at London with the event opened by the Queen herself. During the Jubilee, there were celebrations up and down the country and across the Commonwealth. We even got a four-day weekend. The biggest part of the occasion was the pageant on the River Thames, followed by a massive outdoor concert in front of Buckingham Palace. So again, the Queen has these moments, right, where she just doing little things, like just everybody goes wild over it. The James Bond thing with Daniel Craig where she meets with him and he's kind of like, he's standing there and he's like, <clears throat> and he gets her attention. She turns around, oh, hello, Mr. Bond. And uh, he escorts her out. They get into a helicopter. The next scene you see is James Bond and the Queen jumping out of the helicopter. And then the Queen appears. It was all really cool. Everybody knew it wasn't real, but it's fantastic. And then, of course, the one with her um, Platinum Jubilee just this past summer with Paddington Bear. And then the part where she actually helped 
start We Will Rock You by the band Queen was so cool. Number six, Annas Horribilis. Not every event in the Queen's long yeah. reign was necessarily a good thing, but we have to admire her character and dedication to duty for making it through her Annas Horribilis, or horrible year, in 1992. The royals were steeped in controversy that year, with three of the Queen's children, Charles, Andrew and Anne, all going through very public divorces after each of their marriages broke down. Charles and Diana's infidelities were made known and a terrible fire ravaged Windsor Castle. But despite all that, Her Majesty made it through and showed the country that we can all withstand devastating events. And this was this was pretty remarkable, this speech that she gives here, because this is a very rare moment of the Queen showing her feelings about something and basically saying, this year sucked for me and for my family. And for her to acknowledge that publicly was not something that happened very often at all. In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. It's certainly an example worth looking at in 2022, following her passing. And then this here, what you're seeing there is, um, I believe this is her speech that or her public address that she gave in the aftermath of Diana's death. Number five, visiting Ireland. This was in phenomenal. In July 1911, King George V visited Dublin as part of a tour to mark his coronation. He was to be the last British monarch to officially visit Ireland for an entire century. Remember, Ireland and the UK have a very famous bloody breakup. And among other things, there, there's violence on both sides. You got British troops that are killing Irish citizens. Um, all of this leads to Irish independence in the 1920s. Uh, in the 1970s, you have Prince Philip, her husband. His uncle is murdered in a, in a bombing that kills his, I think, a couple of his grandsons as well, teenagers, uh, kids, really. Um, so, so there's a lot of bad blood here on both sides, and she goes to Ireland. Not only does she go, she opens her speech speaking Gaelic, which was just like you can see um, the one representative, I don't know what her role was, of the Irish government. You can see her mouth, wow. And then she starts clapping when the queen did that. Like it broke down walls in a significant way. So those who say that the monarch doesn't have any real power, that was a moment of tremendous power. That the monarch used what she could do to make very real political change happen. And shortly after this, 26 counties of the island's 32 total became the Irish Free State, and eventually the Republic of Ireland, after winning the Irish War of Independence. There it is. Argus Akoita. Like, she was almost in tears. Like, it's a little thing, right? Her speaking something in Gaelic, but... but there was so much significance to that moment. I honestly thought that would have been higher. In 2011, Her Majesty made a formal state visit to Ireland, the first visit ever by a British monarch to Ireland since its independence from the UK, and indeed, since the end of the Troubles. It is a sad and regrettable reality that through the history, our islands have experienced more than their fair share of heartache, turbulence, and loss. It's I'm an American, so, I mean, obviously, she was never my queen. But, you know, just seeing some of these events play back, gosh, I realize just how important this woman was and how much we're really all going to miss her. ...signified that finally, there was genuine and long-lasting peace between Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland. Number four, decolonization. In the post-war years, the Queen oversaw the almost total decolonization of the British Empire. Countries wanted their freedom from British rule after helping in the war and, finally, this was granted. Imperial Britain was replaced with the Commonwealth of Nations. So remember, when she became Queen, she became Queen in Kenya, 
where she was the queen of Kenya at that time. Kenya was one of the British colonies. And, you know, Africa had been colonized by all of these European powers. You know, the Belgians did this and the French and the Italians and the British and the Germans. Um, and, you know, so that's where she's at. She's on this tour of their colonies. And so now under her, you know, it began under her father to a degree. Um, under her father was when India gets its independence. Her father had been the emperor of India uh, at one time. And then this continues under her reign. Though the Commonwealth officially began in the 1930s, it grew immensely during the Queen's reign, and the Commonwealth was one of the Queen's greatest prides and something she always prioritised during her time on the throne. I feel enormously proud of what the Commonwealth has achieved, and all of it within my lifetime. Today, the Commonwealth has 56 member states, 14 of which still have the British monarch as the head of state. She visited every single Commonwealth nation at least once. Number 3. Coronation Most British monarchs have had formal coronations, with a few exceptions. Edward VIII, for instance, wasn't on the throne long enough to have a coronation before his abdication. So, coronation is not the same as, I mean, he was the king, right? He was never crowned, you know, in theory. The coronation is this whole ceremony. It involves anointing with oil and all these oaths that are given. Um, it's it's almost like it's like a legitimizing thing, and we've had uncrowned, uh, un, uh, you know, monarchs that didn't go through the coronation before because they weren't on the throne long enough. Um, and we'll probably see Charles's coronation at least next year, sometime if not further out. Uh, they'll probably try to be mindful of the situation with you know right now the economy is in a bad situation and things like that so they may wait until things improve before doing something as lavish as a coronation but the queen's coronation was a landmark event it also came just when rationing from the war was finally ending and eight years after peace had finally been achieved in europe creating a monumental atmosphere of mm. celebration in what was one of the most watched television events ever at the time. It was also broadcast internationally and viewed far beyond the UK and the Commonwealth, with even American viewers tuning in to watch Elizabeth II formally sworn in as... So, just cool little thing, and we're going to probably be talking about this when we see Charles's coronation. You notice all the um, all the dukes and earls and things like that um, in the back. They only place their uh, symbols of their office on their heads after the queen has been crowned because it's a recognition that their authority derives from hers. Even American viewers tuning in to watch Elizabeth II formally sworn in as the queen. Number 2. The War Efforts Though she was still just Princess Elizabeth at the time, we would certainly be remiss not to mention the Queen's contribution to the war efforts. So here she is with her dad, uh, George VI right there. Or actually, actually, that's her mom and dad right there. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and George VI. Um, she was 18 in 1944. I mean, so she was 19 when the war ended. So she's very young, but she did. She served. And um, she is, was the last head of state... Uh, in the world who had been a World War II veteran. During the 1940s, it was an early indication of her lifelong commitment to duty that, even when she was only a teenager and heiress presumptive, she joined the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service. She also made many radio broadcasts to keep up Britain's morale, sometimes accompanied by Princess Margaret. She did one when she was like 14 years old, right at the start of the war. Her and Margaret did this radio address because, you know, you got to remember a lot of when the, the raids are happening, the Blitz on London, a lot of families sent their children out of the city and out into the country. Uh, so a lot of these kids are like, their whole world has been upended. And so they spoke specifically to their fellow young people uh, just as a way of uh, reassuring them. Including her first speech to the public on October 13th, 1940. God will care for us and give us victory and peace. That's so cool. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today. This was just when the UK's victory in the Battle of Britain was becoming clear. 
and we neared the end of the Blitz. The stability she helped provide during the war lasted for the rest of her life. She basically grew up with the war. I mean, she was, she was born in 1926, so she's like 13, 12, 13 when the war starts. Um, and she's in uniform uh, as an adult when the war ends. Number 1. Longest Reigning Monarch in 2015, Queen Elizabeth II officially became the longest reigning monarch in Britain's history. It looked for a long time that she was going to beat the previous record of 63 years and 7 months set by Queen Victoria, who ascended to the throne when she was just 18. Her great great grandma. Her majesty grandma. was on the throne for a little over 70 years, celebrating her platinum jubilee earlier in 2022. This is the only platinum jubilee in the history of the UK, and given the extraordinary circumstances that led to the Queen's long reign, it could perhaps be the only platinum jubilee we'll ever have, yeah. as it seems unlikely another monarch would take the throne at such a young enough age to enable a seven decade reign again. Do you agree with all? Amazing, amazing stuff. So I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, throw up a link to my commentary from yesterday's events in Edinburgh. Definitely we'll be doing more of that uh, in the near future with some of the events that are unfolding. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.